This is the Reluctant Leader Podcast, brought to you by the Reluctant Leader Academy. I'm your host, Mark Terrell, and in each episode, I will invite an expert guest to discuss a topic or subject that will enhance your knowledge and hopefully inspire you on your leadership journey. If managing people is becoming your biggest headache, then check out the How to Lead Your Team with Confidence course and join the next group program starting soon. So let's see who's in the hot seat today. Today I'm talking to Rob Law from one of the most famous rejections on BBC's Dragon's Den in 2006. Rob has successfully built a team who has pioneered a new retail category of children's travel products, designing and creating a range of innovative solutions which help families on the go. The iconic ride-on suitcase has been manufactured in the UK since 2012. His company has sold over 4 million suitcases in over 100 countries and won over 120 awards. Rob is passionate about inspiring future business leaders and designers, has received two honorary doctorates and an MBE for services to business. He has just launched his memoirs, 65 Roses and a Trunky, Define the Odds in Life and Business, which shares his story of resilience. I hope you enjoyed this chat we had about resilience and I'll catch you all on the other side. So Rob, welcome to the Reluctant Leader podcast. Thank you, Mark. Um, I've come across, uh, well, I've seen you many times, um, uh, especially obviously your uh, Dragon's Den um, escapade, which I'm sure we will uh, cover in our 30 minutes or so chat. Um, but what I've been meaning to do is actually talk about the subject that we're we're going to talk about later um and you have come across as the, just the perfect person at the right time to talk about this uh, the, the subject of resilience but before we get stuck into that i always ask my guests uh, why do you do what you do and what was the pivotal moment that took you down that route yeah i think i'm i'm quite lucky to have found my passion early on in life and uh, the road to where i am now started when i was 14 when i decided i wanted to be a product designer and um i struggled at school because i've got dyslexia i've always been good with my hands and um i liked art and woodwork or cdt as it was called then uh, and when i was 14 i started researching the different careers in design and product design really caught my attention and uh, I started buying books and uh, learning all I could about it and really focusing on trying to become a, a product, professional product designer and that took me all the way to to the best university in the land at the time which was Northumbria where Jonathan Ives of Apple fame studied and um, yeah my passion really grew to um, use that design to enable you to create great products that en- enabled and enhanced people's lives um, mm-hmm. And while I was at university, it was where I came up with the idea for the ride-on suitcase, now known as Trunky. And um, yeah, I, I actually, at one point in my career, I was, I was still working for a design agency in Bristol, and my biggest client was Unilever, and I was designing um, for all these great big FMCG brands and <clears throat> kind of creating products that the world really didn't need, you know, kind of... Uh, devices to put more bleach down the toilet and electronic deodorant cans required six AAA batteries to work. And I started to get a bit, a bit disillusioned by my kind of uh, late twenties. And um, I'd licensed Trunky to a, a toy company for three years and they hadn't done a very good job and ended up going into administration. So I was kind of at a pivotal moment where I was getting a bit hard. I was finding it quite hard to get out of bed in the morning and my beloved project that had been rolling along in the background for nine years had come to an abrupt halt and I just thought well you know what the, the toy company have been marketing this as a as just a simple ride on toy and it's not and I've been rejected from luggage manufacturers but everyone's got it wrong it's it's a lifestyle brand that should be aimed at parents um, to enable them to travel better um, so that was the kind of pivotal moment where I decided well I'll, I'll, um, I'll have a go at running my own business. Right. And obviously, there's a lot of history that's uh, gone on since. But I, we're going to be talking about resilience here. And um, I've just finished reading your book, which I highly recommend anyone reading. It's a, it's a combination of great, uh, a great business book. And also, um, it's a sort of autobiography as well, isn't it? Um, and it, it um, yeah, we wanted to make uh, we wanted to make the story more read like a, um, 
a kind of a novel um, and, and a piece of fiction, even though it's uh, not fiction, uh, and, mm. and just uh, allow the readers to get really engrossed in the story. I think storytelling is a really powerful medium, uh, and rather than a boring, dry how-to business book, we wanted to take you on my my journey. Absolutely, and that, that's why it's so good, and that's why you, it's one of those books you can't put down, and that's why I've, I've read it um, in um, over a weekend. So, um, so what it does, your book, is actually um, when we talk about resilience, it talks about lots of things that um, we know happens in business. Business is never one nice um, upward curve or upward. Um, graph which just gets better and better there's uh, along the way there's some big uh, hurdles along the um along the way which we've got to um cope with uh, and um obviously when we're coping with those things resilience is really important so when we um obviously you've been in many cases where you your resilience has actually allowed you to overcome these difficulties and probably would be a good idea just to maybe uh, just talk about a few of those big um challenges that you've had um that you've had to you know show some resilience yeah okay so i well i guess um the book's called 65 roses in the trunky because it's uh, uh my first sort of um uh, public outing on uh, on my uh, personal battle, which is dealing with cystic fibrosis. So I, I was born with cystic fibrosis, and that's been a, a battle of mine personally that I've been enduring for 42 years. And um, I thought it was, it was about time to kind of tell that side of the story as well, because that's really where my resilience kind of stems from. Uh, and the title 65 roses is is, is um what children call cystic fibrosis because they struggle with the pronunciation so um so yeah I was, uh i didn't really know any better i was just born with this disease and my new my normal was having to do lots of physiotherapy take lots of medication be on a low fat diet for the first eight years of my life um but whenever i tried to get seek self-pity my mum uh, kind of squarely put me in my place and there's people worth us worse off than you uh, and that kind of really kind of was drilled into me so whenever I've, I've had a challenge um, I haven't really taken the route down worrying about it or wallowing in self-pity or the injustness of whatever the, the hurdle might be I just simply got on with trying to solve it I guess I'm a, a natural problem solver at heart which is why I went down the product design route um and a pivotal moment for me in my earlier years uh, was when I sadly lost my twin sister to the disease when we were 16 uh, and kind of faced with either uh, a road of um, uh, self-pity and, and waiting to succumb to the disease or I could choose life and try and make the most of it. And that, that required me to focus on the things I could control and, and ignoring the rest. So I think that's been a, one of my fundamental lessons to try and overcome challenges is it takes a huge amount of energy to overcome them. Uh, uh, and um, if you can focus that energy on the things you can control and influence and try not to waste time on the things you can't, and a great example at the moment during COVID, I can't influence when the government are going to release their lockdown um, measures and when international travel is going to resume, but I can focus on controlling costs, pivoting my market message, marketing message to visiting grandma and staycations and um, trying to look for the green shoots and the opportunities. Yeah, and I, yeah, I picked that up from the book. It's obviously, there's that, you know, if you've, if you've already mentioned your twin sister and, and that promise you made to her, um, is uh, something that's obviously driven you in many ways and uh, the way you uh, handle things and, and what you actually m promised that you would do for her has, has driven you, I, I guess. And it's, it's having that probably that connection to something more than you has probably helped you in, in some way, I guess. Yeah, I mean, everyone thinks the Dragon's Den was a big insurmountable challenge or how on earth did I cope with it? But it, it really wasn't that big a thing. It was, it was a mere blip in my uh, adventure. And um, yeah, without knowing the backstory, it's quite hard to see how how I didn't see it as such a significant challenge. Um, I mean, yeah, that those who remember the episode, it was season three. I took the trunky on Dragon's Den, asking for £100,000 for 10% of my business. Uh, the pitch went perfectly, towed Richard Farley around the studio until Theo got hold of the product and yanked off the toe strap and it all kind of started tumbling out of control. Um, but to me, I just just could not understand. It was such an easy problem to solve. The, the toe strap didn't break, it just popped off 
and it could be made in a stronger plastic if it was really an issue in the first place. Um, but the dragons just lambasted me and saw it as a, an insurmountable challenge uh, and kind of all packed up against me, um, uh, which is a bit unfortunate, really. But looking back now, I wouldn't change a thing. But I left the den empty-handed, and I really wished um, I'd invented a time machine and not a ride-on suitcase. But I knew it wouldn't. It would be a couple of months before the, the episode aired, and I was starting to get lots of international interest. And I, I was exporting to Australia and Japan and America. Um, uh, and then I finally got a, a, my break with John Lewis on High Street because all the luggage buyers were telling me it was a toy, and the toy buyers were telling me it was luggage, and no one would take it on. Mm. So I started. Um, started getting some traction and then um, I knew this was an event that was going to happen in the future in a couple of months the BBC were going to air the episode uh, but they never told me when and uh, I kept going down to the local um, news agents to pick up a radio times and find out when it was going to air and one particular day I was down there flicked to Tuesday BBC two nine o'clock wheelie rubbish it was written in the, it was in the paper and the, the colour drained from my face and I just thought oh my god this is gonna be a bigger challenge than I initially thought uh, and I might not have a business the next day but I did did quite quickly re- realize that I was going to get a lot of traffic to the website probably wouldn't sell anything but if I'm getting lots of traffic to the website what can I do I mean this is 2006 before all the fancy tech you have now I just thought well I'll, I'll post a survey up online and see what the public really think of the product try and maybe there's some fine tuning I can do in the marketing message maybe with there may be some insights into improving my product so I posted it up and that night over 2,000 people filled in the survey with phenomenal words of support and it was a real kind of moment because I tried to get the product licensed to manufacturers and they couldn't see the opportunity. I tried to sell it to retailers. They couldn't see the opportunity and I tried to get investment behind it and they didn't see the opportunity. Uh, but the public, uh, the, the end user, the consumer knew about, knew it was a great product, loved the idea. And uh, I ended up selling out that night. So yeah, it, was, it was really a battle of trying to get uh, the end user now direct consumer brands uh, 10 a penny but back in the day that just wasn't really an easy option to choose yeah it's interesting isn't it you would think that would be the worst possible advert but actually as it turned out it wasn't the market for you wasn't the 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 the, the dragons obviously the dragons were there you wanted some investment and there's um, their money and probably their expertise but actually what was on showcase was actually a new concept which not nobody had seen before and all of a sudden, suddenly, you know, there was, you know, all those people thinking, I want one of those. Um, and, uh, and consequently, you sold out, which um, I guess, looking back, was the opportunity, wasn't it? That's, you know, what, what seemed like the worst thing that was, could possibly happen turned out to be, you know, one of the best things. Yeah, and it's, it's just kind of knowing there's going to be this challenge, trying to think creatively mm. at how to solve it and, and just going through it. And you never know how it's going to necessarily pan out. There, There's never... a uh, a right, perfect way of doing things. There's just ways that work and ways that don't, and you just got to try. Uh, yeah. And hopefully, with a bit of luck, some things work. Um, some things won't. But when they don't work, you've, you've got to realise um, that you need to change things to to try and get around that obstacle. Uh, yeah, and yeah. how you see something working might not be the way it has to work to be commercially successful. And you've just got to navigate your way around by testing, iterating, getting feedback, and and getting getting your idea, whatever it may be, to to the market. Yeah. And there's already a theme going on here. It's, it's that turning that negative into a positive. Um, you know, there's two two um, scenarios there where, you know, something very negative has, has um, been turned, you've been able to turn into a positive and uh, obviously uh, that's uh, to your credit. But that, uh, as we, we are talking about resilience here, gets, you know, um, there's not everyone that can do that. So is there, is there anything that you put anything down to that allows you to be like that? I mean, you talked about your creativity, one thing, um, but, you know, I, I talk a little bit about growth mindset and, and and is that something that you sort of resonate with, always having that that mentality around learning as opposed to making, making a mistake or failing? Yeah, I think um, anyone can get pretty good at something if they're, they're really determined to, to learn and focus intensely on on that particular subject um they may not be the best in the world but you can definitely get really good at doing something if you really dedicate and sacrifice a lot of other things to really focus in on on becoming good at something um 
Uh, and if, if you can find something you're really passionate about, then time just disappears and you don't feel like you're a workaholic and you don't feel like you're spending insane amounts of time on something because you're just following your passion. Um, so, the, yeah. I mean, on the growth mindset, um, mm. I think definitely following, finding something you really enjoy doing, um, time just disappears. Um, but I realized quite early on uh, I had a great product, but to get the business to the next level, I was going to need a great team. And that was a, a bit of a growth journey for me, understanding about leadership. Uh, I came from an industry where you just worked in the office to, as, as long as possible because you were passionate about giving the client a great product so eating pizza in the office every night and things like that mm-hmm. so when I started employing people and they were leaving at 5 30 I, I really struggled to understand why they were leaving because uh, I just hadn't experienced that kind of um, uh, different environment <clears throat> so I had to quickly start learning about what motivates other people how can I align their motivation with the business and that that was simply understanding that uh, what our why was, what our purpose is. Um, we don't make plastic luggage. We make products that allow parents and carers to, <clears throat> to take their kids off exploring the world. And making that really clear so that not just uh, the people coming to join us to work with us and the people we work with externally, but, but that's also a message that's really relevant to our customers too. Um, so yeah, really learning about leadership. And I think we all um, we all sometimes kind of put appraisals at the bottom of the list, don't we? But actually it's such an important tool just to engage uh, and learn from from your team, how they're doing, what they're thinking. Um, so yeah, just just trying to flip some of these these things um, and really see them from a different angle to, to try and yeah. embrace them and be motivated to do them. So it's a part in the book when you talk about when you purchase the factories, I guess that's when you went on your steep learning curve with regards to leadership and, and what that entailed. Uh, because previous to that, I think you were having um, products manufactured in China, weren't you? And But you took the decision to bring things back into the UK. Yeah, well, when, when we reshored production in 2012, it all went off with a fanfare. But by the end of the year, the factory was really struggling, um, a third-party factory, and they went into administration. So we did a pre-pack and bought them out. And, um, yeah, really passionate about reshoring. There's a huge resurgence of reshoring. I thought there were more business opportunities there. We still manufacture for other people, not just ourselves. Um, so I thought it was a great business opportunity as well. And um, when you're doing your limited due diligence for a pre-pack, you can't lift up all the carpets and find out all the problems. You, you have to just take a judgment call. Mm. And when I got down there with the keys, I just could not believe it. The, the night shift would produce scrap all night. It was like a factory of headless chickens. I mean, uh, it was it was pretty crazy. No one had had an appraisal. No one had a job description. No one really knew what they were doing. No one liked the previous manager, the owner. Um, no one cared. So we had to we had to take a deep breath and thinking back to being motivated, getting out of the bed in the morning, trying to come to work. It became very apparent that the first thing I needed to do was try and find what people are passionate about in the factory. So we ran a workshop uh, and it became quite apparent that people were proud to be manufacturing in the UK. So we printed off a sign, put it outside the door, proud to be manufacturing in the UK. And that was kind of a, a bit of a rallying course for people to start working together. Um, uh, and then it was a bit of a long process to find the right people within the business. Always keen to try and find internal people and upskill them. Uh, but at the time, we really needed some external ex- expertise in, in the, a production manager, and we really struggled to find that, so that set us back a bit. But, yeah, it was a slow, painful process, but um, but now uh, it's a huge, proud achievement. But, but what's great is the factory really have ownership of what they do. They have, they're in control of their destiny, and they can make decisions uh, without having to call me up all the time and they're, they're kind of running their own business and they're really passionate and they can all actually get, go and get a much better paid job down the road but they choose to stay because they know they, they have real control on their decision making and they can really make a difference with their ideas whereas in bigger corporates you're kind of just a small cog in a big machine. Yeah and I, and I guess you know the vision that you are obviously um, 
um, sh- shared with them is obviously it's not just about the product like you've d- d- described. It's not just about we're making this product. It's about actually what we allow to happen when people buy this product. It's allowing them, you know, to take their ch- children on this almost like on a, a fantasy um, journey that they haven't been able to do before because that traveling bit has never been enjoyable. But what you're doing is actually um, almost starting the the, the holiday at the point when they leave and they pack their suitcase because they want to get their trunky out. That's, that's, I guess that's part of the passion around the product. It's, it's extending almost the holiday into the start of when you pack because when you get your trunky out, that's when the holiday starts. Yeah, there's the educational bit of learning to pack what you want to take and you can't take everything um, mm. all the way through to um, these trunkies go on all sorts of adventures with the kids whether imaginary ones at home going to see grandma <clears throat> off on different holidays but they're, they're kind of with them for five plus years so they've got this little travel pal there little pet trunky <clears throat> that's sharing all these experiences with them and being in some of these photos uh, really cherished memories that they'll look back on so um i like to say at the end of the trunkie's life um keep it as a childhood memory box yeah absolutely and i think it's a good point now just to just to maybe talk about a few other products you make now because you, you make more than just trunkies now don't you should you've um, i know there's a, a car seat uh, but yeah so we just... um i got the got tr- trunky out and i suddenly realized there was a bit of a niche in the market for toddler travel i mean there's lots of baby travel gear from car seats and push chairs but the and but there's nothing after sort of 12 months so um uh yeah again talking to consumers we found um there was a real gap in the market for uh, a car seat that could travel and we developed what we call booster pack which is a fully certified car booster seat that's hollow inside and you can access that for storage and it's all encased in in fabric so you can carry it as a backpack um, so that, that's a great step up. That's kind of four plus. Once you've your grown your trunky, you can move on to that product. Uh, and then neck rests. The problem with um, kids sleeping in the back of the car is the head always lulls forward, and all neck rests just to support the back and the side of the neck. No one had created something that supports the chin. So we created a product we call Yondi, which is a, a head hugger, and that has ingenious magnetic pores that softly close underneath the chin and provide a chin rest, allowing them to have a nice, comfortable sleep. And then other other products we've done are uh, waterproof swimming bags using the roll top technology from the outdoor market. We call those paddle packs. And and then more recently, through my own experience of of having kids, um, trying to get them to the shops on their scooters and bikes and always dawdling. We ended up launching a range of folding bikes and scooters that come with a trunky strap so you can tow them along, carry it over your shoulder or, or hang it over the buggy. So, yeah, it's been a, a great adventure in product development, but you have, I mean, I have thousands of ideas uh, and they all have to be whittled down to only one or two really genuinely good ideas. Um, so the thing that frustrates me, I mean, I've, I've been trained in this, but people are sitting on the sofa and they think, oh, I've got an idea. Um, and then think they think it's very easy then to take the idea to market, but you've got to have a, over a hundred good ideas to whittle it down to a commercial idea that is never going to be how you envisage it. Cause you've got to take it through lots of consumer testing, iterating and finding out what really works in the market to finally then have a product that does work. So, um, it's a, it's a big intensive process product development. Um, uh, but one that I'm very passionate about. Yes, and I noticed the tone in your voice when you started talking about your products. Then, Rob, I mean, not that it was uh, bad, you know, not low before, but obviously you can always tell in the tonation of someone when they're talking about something they're passionate about when they start talking about their products. That was uh, that was, that was brilliant. Um, what's something that you mention in the book quite often is that you see everything as a problem to solve, and I guess in some ways that's you know that's a positive but i guess sometimes that can be a bit of a negative and that you're always trying to solve problems and maybe that um, maybe don't need to be solved no um i i, I choose which ones to solve um <laughs> i've only got so much energy so i can't solve all the problems but um yeah. but yeah it's just just um just deciding where to focus that energy um mm. I mean, one <clears throat> one problem we had uh, was around some copying, and that's one of the chapters in the book about t- taking a, a copycat all the way to the Supreme Court. But that ended up being a problem I couldn't solve. We, we got to the highest court in the land, and we ended up losing the case. It cost an absolute fortune. Um, but I had to kind of realise that was the end of that road, and um, did, I 
I, I was pretty upset for a couple of days, but I, I realised I couldn't waste my energy in this bad space. I've lost. There's nothing else I can do. I've got to move on. Uh, mm. But I took, took some joy in the fact that uh, we managed to to win in a small way with um, getting the press to rally behind us and, and having a huge amount of positive exposure about it. Mm. And, and I guess that's the thing with re- resilience is, is managing your energy, isn't it? Realising that is actually I'm expelling energy here, which is doing no good. And realizing that at some point you need to sort of get back into that frame of mind, growth mindset, or whatever you want to call it, in that you know using my energy in a in a positive way, but um, and and con- so that I can change things that I'm in control of, and that, that's that's again that's a theme through the book is actually focusing on the things you can change and and trying not to get focused on the things you can't. Yeah. And that's when I, that's when you see opportunities. I mean, if you're just wallowing in the unknown and not having no control, you've got no no brand, bandwidth to think of any opportunities. But when you're when you're trying to navigate through these big challenges um, and and influencing the things you can influence, that's when you start sort of seeing opportunities. Um, and going through COVID at the moment, uh, there are lots of opportunities out there, and there'll be even more on the other side. And it's just weathering that storm, conserving the energy, using it wisely, um, uh, so that you've 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 got that energy to exploit on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's an, uh, uh, we shouldn't um, not visit the sort of character side of things and those character traits that you probably take for granted. I'm, I'm thinking of things like optimism and curiosity, creativity, um, perseverance, obviously, and, and, and staying enthusiastic. Is there any other sort of character traits that you um, would mention um, to, that, that helped you along the way and obviously helped you stay resilient? Yeah, I think always being the optimist um, definitely definitely helps. Um, although, yeah, that can uh, that can lead to overcalling numbers and sales plans. So, uh, yeah, I've learned to tone those down a bit over the years. Um, yeah, I I think just coming back to that resilience thing, another thing I learned, and this is probably a bit later on in my journey, is. Uh, having experienced quite a few challenges that they're always only ever going to be finite they won't last forever Mm. Uh, and navigating particularly hard ones I've kind of felt well it's a bad road I'm going down here but uh, it won't last forever I've just got to hold on we'll get to the other side don't quite know what it's going to look like but there will be another side Um, uh, and I've just got to stop wasting my energy trying to um, try to worry about it and just try and find solutions to it Mm, absolutely right well I'm, I'm conscious of time Rob I know your time is precious um, you're very busy um, and we tried to keep these podcasts to about 30 minutes max and, and we're 25 minutes in so we've got five minutes to sort of sum things up I always ask my guests to give us some top tips at the end it doesn't have to be three um, it could be any any number but um, what would you how would you sum up what we've been talking about especially around the, the subject of resilience and how you can um, you know give anybody that's listening some advice about how they cope with those real um, times of adversity in their life and, and in business yeah I guess some, something like re- resilience to me is all about um, challenges are finite uh, but challenges are incredibly mentally draining to overcome take a huge amount of energy so focus that energy on the things you can control try to forget about the things that you can't and that enables you to see opportunities while you're navigating through this new landscape um uh, and yeah hopefully you'll have the energy to then go off and exploit some of these opportunities and it, it may not be what you initially thought it would be you may have to pivot quite dramatically to to succeed and you may not get from a to b but you you should get to c and that should be a much better place than a if that makes sense <laughs> Yeah, absolutely makes sense. And and I think, you know, um, you know, again, I started with the mention to the book and I, I think, you know, we've, we've skimmed over an awful lot and the, the book um, expands on an awful, lot of thing, an awful lot of things that you've um, encountered, the challenges you've had with the with Dragon's Den and all the other things with um, the court case and all that sort of stuff. But you've shown an enormous amount of resilience and here you are. Well, not at the end of the journey, but uh, you know, you'll get to a point where I, I guess things are a bit more comfortable for you. And that, um, I think at the end of the book, you mentioned that you're um, were thinking about th- a three-day week. Uh, is that still reality? 
Yeah, I've been on a three-day week for uh, about four years now, and that was right. partly down to wanting to start a family and spend some incredible time with my kids and, and explore other opportunities like this book. So, yeah, it's been um, been great to build a fantastic team to run the day-to-day and to free me up. Yes, and um, and there's a lovely story at the end of your your trip in your trunky, um, which I, I won't spoil for the readers. But it's, it was a really so a, a nice way to finish the book, uh, and almost like uh, an envision, envisioning uh, your own trip on your own trunky. So um, <laughs> thank you, Rob, for today. Really enjoyed it. I ha- um, I wish you all success in the future. And um, again, thank you very much for um, giving up your time today. Thanks for inviting me, Mark. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed the episode, please take the time to leave a review on your chosen platform and share on social media. Don't forget to check out the Reluctant Leader Academy, where you'll find a free 15 questions every manager should be asking themselves checklist that you can download to keep you on track every day. Leadership is a choice. When you understand the right mindset, know the process to follow and use key skills to keep things moving forward, you'll be on track to leave a lasting legacy. Until next time, be the best you can be and the inspiration for others to follow.